I often get asked why I use sake so much in my recipes. And in this four part series, I'm exploring why it's such a magical ingredient. In the last episode, I gave you a little background about what umami is, its history, and why you should care. So if you haven't watched it already, hit the link up here to check out that video. In this episode, I'm going to be exploring how sake is made and why it has such a high concentration of umami producing amino acids. To help me answer some of these questions, I spoke with some folks that are a lot smarter than me. And my first stop was at a rice farm in Hyogo Prefecture to learn about the rice that's used for making sake. Oyama-san is a third generation rice farmer who's been cultivating rice for sake in the mountains northwest of Kobe for over 30 years. So I know you're growing sakamai here. What is the difference between rice for sake and rice for eating? それとその粒の中に心拍という白い濁った部分があるんですけどもそれがきっちり大きく出ているのが大きな違いですねで食用のままその心拍はありません is there something special about this region that makes it particularly well suited for growing sakamai? やはりその now, is there anything special that you do for your rice that makes especially good sake? So today we learned about how rice is grown out here in these fields. So let's find out how this turns into this. So I had planned to meet up with my friend, Professor Kenichi Yoshida. He's a specialist in applied microbiology at Kobe University. Unfortunately, I had to scrap my travel plans due to the pandemic, but he's been kind enough to join us here remotely to explain the processes involved in brewing sake. So, Professor, can you walk us through the process of how rice, this bland, starchy food, can be turned into such a flavorful liquid? Yeah, it has been told, like, uh, we eat a lot of rice, but rice to be eaten is completely different from the one we use for sake fermentation. So all the species, the sepaj is called usually a Yamada Nishiki is the best, but a big size of plant. This uh, rice has to be polished on the surface because on the surface there are a lot of contaminants. Usually to have a very high quality of sake, we have to sacrifice 50% of original weight of rice. So only the core part can be used for the fermentation rice. Okay. So then uh, this part is very rich with starch and rest rich with the protein. And uh, we use the first one uh, microbe called the uh, koji mold. This is uh, a kind of a fungi. And uh, uh, this can has a high capacity of enzyme production. And his enzyme is used for the degradation of rice grain. So like starch into sugar and the protein into amino acid. Then uh, the other uh, microbe called yeast is coming to make the fermentation of alcohol production. Uh, mold, degradation rice, and alcohol fermentation yeast all together in parallel. Then finally, the result is kind of groggy or very uh, like a viscous. But later we press it to filtrate to have a clear sake then it's been sold in the market. So one of the things I'm interested in learning about today are the amino acids in sake because that's what creates that taste of umami. 
Can you tell us a little bit about how those amino acids are produced during fermentation? Okay. On the surface part of rice grain is rich with protein. So if you prepare, preserve some amount of this protein, you can have uh, the uh, original ingredient to contain the protein there, right? So then the mold has very rich with the production of enzyme, which is called a protease, degrade the protein into amino acid. Mm -hmm. So uh, of course, um, they like to use amino acid for their own living, okay? But they cannot consume everything. So that is why they have some residual amino acid staying there. But as I told you, if you want to make a very high quality sake, you have to sacrifice surface part of the rice. Then you will lose the chance to obtain more protein there. So the very good uh, high quality sake is less rich in amino acid. So actually buying cheaper sake is better for cooking if you're looking to get the most umami out of it? Exactly. That's interesting. So what types of amino acids give sake its umami and flavor? Okay, the richest one is glutamic acid because the glutamic acid is the most abundant in uh, every single cell system. Yeah. The other one is uh, alanine. Alanine is the taste of uh, fresh water clam. You know? And this is also tasty. And the second one is uh, aspartic acid. Aspartic acid is a taste of soybean. And also sometimes we can taste asparagus. Actually, this was identified asparagus first. So that's a, that is called asparagine. Oh, really? And finally, uh, like a proline. Proline is also rich in the sake. And the proline is the taste of uh, pork meat. Ooh, that's interesting. So this is like giving me a bunch of ideas for new ways that I can cook with sake. But I'm curious. How does the amino acid content of sake compare to something like beer or wine? Uh, well, I think uh, um, beer and sake is almost e equally levels of the fermentation uh, thing. And as for wine, I think they are not very rich with amino acid. And they are more uh, rich with the phenolic compound and also or the other esters, like a f actually they are coming from fruit. So these are quite different and they are not very rich with amino acid. Interesting. So, I mean, I guess grapes don't have a lot of protein. So it makes sense that you wouldn't get many amino acids out of the wine, but a lot of people cook with wine. So I guess it's more about the aromatic compounds than the umami from the amino acids. So maybe if you combine both of them and use them together, you could get the flavor of the wine, but also the umami from the sake. Yeah, that's a very clever way. And actually, it's been recommended to make a mixture of uh, sake and wine. For example, like uh, if you use a uh, mariné, so like you make a mixture with the wine and the vinegar on there to solve their fish or vegetable, whatever. Then if you add a trace amount of Japanese sake, it can enrich the taste, as you say. And this is a very, very interesting way to, you know, or have the, this is really synergetic effect to make the dishes more tasty. Interesting. So this is super exciting for me because I feel like this is an area that hasn't been explored much in the culinary space. You know, I, I think a lot of people stick to one genre of alcohol with one style of cuisine, but really sake could be used as an ingredient to make even non-Japanese food taste better. So now you know how sake is made and why it contains such an abundance of amino acids which create the taste of umami in Japanese food. But since umami makes any food taste better, can sake be used as an ingredient in cuisines from other parts of the world? To find out, I'm going to be talking to a French chef and doing some experiments in my own kitchen in the next episode. So be sure to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell so you don't miss out.